So what we know about the preterm birth rate is that it has hovered around 10% for about the last 10 years. And you can see that there was a slight dip a few years ago. And then since that time, it's gradually climbed up again, um, such that the preterm birth rate in 2018 was 10.02%. So virtually everyone who that is involved in primary care is going to be seeing children who were born uh, prematurely. Next slide, please. What we also know about the preterm birth rate is that it varies significantly by geographic location as well as other populations uh, characteristics. In this slide, you can see that in 2019, Oregon was the state with the lowest preterm birth rate um, and that rate was 7.8%. Mississippi was the state with the highest rate and that was 14.2%. Uh, so you can see it's almost double the um, rate in Oregon. So where you practice in the country and the kinds of patients that you see can really affect the number of preterm infants that you will be seeing in practice. Next slide. Preterm birth rate also varies significantly by race and ethnicity with Asian Pacific Islanders having the lowest um, rate and with the black population having the highest rate. Next slide. We think of taking care of preterm infants as a moving target. And that's because the recommendations vary by gestational age. In addition, the recommendations are continually being updated and they come from a variety of organizations. They don't come from just one organization. Um, we're gonna to talk today about incorporating the guidelines at the time of NICU discharge to aid in the transition to primary care um, and subspecialty follow-up. Jadine and I both have um, a background in primary care, and in fact, that's where we first met. Um, but we also have additional experience. Jadine is working as a, um, a uh, neonatal hospitalist, and I also work in high-risk infant follow-up. So I think we have seen a lot of these preterm children ourselves in our various practices, but we also understand what it's like to be on the receiving end of these the children when we are working in primary care and how challenging it is to stay up to date on the recommendations and the appropriate care for these children. So at this time, uh, next slide please, I'm going to turn it over to Jadine to start to answer some of these questions about the care of these children. Thanks so much Janice. Next slide. So we'll start by talking about growth and nutrition in babies that are discharged from the NICU. So we're gonna do a poll. Go ahead and let us know which growth chart you think is the best one to use for babies when they're recently discharged from the NICU. All right, so let's see what our results are. So it looks like about half of you chose the Fenton growth chart um, and uh, it's kind of evenly spaced among some of the other options as well. So let's go ahead and close the poll and move on to the next slide. So the correct answer is actually the World Health Organization, the WHO growth chart. But what we found is when we've done this prior lecture, and it's primarily for primary care providers, that a vast majority will choose F, which is the I have no idea, um, because I think everyone's busy and they default to whatever is the easiest to grab in the EMR. Um, so that's something that is important for NICU providers to understand, to be able to communicate in the discharge summary which growth charts outpatient providers should use. Next slide. 
So a lot of you chose the Fenton growth chart, and this is used for inpatients while they're in the NICU. It's valid for preterm infants until about two months of age, and it doesn't require any age adjustment. The way you use it is to plot by postmenstrual age, which is gestational age plus chronological age. And this goes up to 50 weeks postmenstrual age. Next slide. So here you can see an example of the Fenton growth chart for girls. And in the X axis, you can see that it's gestational age, which you can use at birth and then after that use postmenstrual age, uh, going all the way up to 50 weeks. Next slide. So the WHO growth charts are recommended for infants and children up to two years of age. They're based on breastfed infants and children in six different countries, and the AAP recommends these as well. Next slide. The CDC growth charts are used for children two years and older in the United States, and it's based on NHANES data. Next slide. So let's use an example plotting growth. Harry is almost 16 months old, and he was born at 31 plus two weeks gestational age. His weight today is 9.5 kilograms. Next slide. So if we were to plot him on the CDC growth chart, which is really better for children two years and older, his weight would plot out to the fifth percentile, which makes him look pretty low on his curve. Next slide. But if you use the appropriate WHO growth chart, you can see that he actually falls into eight, the 18th percentile, which is much better. And next slide. And then if you use his corrected age, taking into account his gestational age, then his corrected age percentile is actually the 30th percentile. Next slide. So these examples are from the EPIC system in my institution, and all EPIC systems do vary, and other EMRs will vary. So it's important to be familiar with the EMR in your institution and how to find the right growth charts. So here for our EPIC, in the upper right-hand corner, you could see I've chosen the WHO chart for girls. This is a 25 plus three week gestational age girl who's um, nine months now. And you can click on that, um, the little magnifying glass, and it will show you a lot of different growth chart options. But if you don't see a specific one you're looking for, especially if it's specialized, for example, for trisomy 21 patients, you can unclick the apply patient filter and you'll find a vast list of many, many more growth charts available. So kind of explore your EMR and see what's available to you. And then to get the corrected age, you want to check the box that says show gestation adjusted age. And so here we have a 25 plus three week gestational age girl. And we show this one because at the lower gestational ages, you'll find a bigger difference when you plot the corrected age. So this girl is third percentile for her chronological age, but when you use the correction, she actually is in the 18th percentile. And you know, picture is worth a thousand words. And we find that parents are actually really relieved when they see the differences in these growth charts. There was a patient that came to high-risk infant follow-up clinic and her parents were really worried about her growth. The, parent, the uh, pediatrician had shown them a growth chart and that looked like she was very, very below where she should be. So they were really concerned that she wasn't eating enough, wasn't growing well enough. But when they saw the corrected growth charts and they saw that she was actually growing in the appropriate range, they were actually much relieved. Um, and this is really a preoccupation of a lot of families. So showing them the growth charts and showing them the corrected age really helps them understand uh, when they need to be worried and when it just is a matter of a preterm baby. Next slide. So preterm infants are at risk for growth failure after discharge. And the goals after discharge should be to always promote breastfeeding. That's always the best for the baby if mother has enough milk. Look for a normal rate of growth using the corrected age. And also avoid overfeeding. There's so much focus on feeding these babies in the NICU and what is their weight and how much did they gain that often parents are preoccupied with that and they really want to feed, feed, feed their baby. 
um, when they're home and they actually end up being overweight. So it's important to watch out for the opposite end as well. Next slide. So why should post-discharge formulas be used? Most commonly, the post-discharge formulas that we use are Enficare or Neosure, and these are 22 calories per ounce, although they can be mixed in a powder form to a higher calorie count. And for preterm infants, these supply more calories, protein, vitamins, and minerals than a standard term formula would. These post-discharge formulas can help to improve growth, and they also improve brain growth. Next slide. In this table, you see the recommended nutrients for infants up to six months of age. And in the left-hand column is term infants. The other columns are various preterm infants. And you can see that for the preterm infants, their needs for protein, calcium, phosphorus, and iron are all higher than in term infants. Next slide. So when you compare this to a table showing the post-discharge formulas, you can see that on the left-hand column is mother's milk. The next two columns are post-discharge formulas. And then the other columns are term formulas. And again, the protein, calcium, and phosphorus are increased in the post-discharge formulas, which are the ones that would really help the preterm infants the most. Next slide. So who needs post-discharge formula supplementation if there's enough breast milk? The very low birth weight infants are at the highest risk, so attention should always be paid to their growth. But supplementation recommendations vary, and we found variants by geographic area, by institution. We've also found that there's continual evolution as knowledge about NICU nutrition, nutrition continues to improve. Next slide. So we present here some approaches to using post-discharge formula, but there's really not any one gold standard or one recommendation. I found that the easiest is to substitute the post-discharge formula for breast milk for two to three feedings a day. This way, the moms can still breastfeed, and if they give their milk, they don't have to worry about mixing in another uh, powder to try to increase the calories. But another option can be to fortify the breast milk with post-discharge formula. You can use the powder and you can mix to 22 or 24 calories per ounce, most commonly, or even higher. And you can give it, in general, start at two to three feedings per day. But you can also give post-discharge formula by itself with increased frequency if you find that there's problems with growth. Next slide. So prim primary care providers often ask, how long should they use the post-discharge formula? after discharge. And again, there's no one gold standard or recommendation, but a general rule of thumb, we feel that if the birth weight is greater than 1800 grams, then using post-discharge formula is probably not necessary if your growth is okay. But under 18 grams, you should pay attention to the growth and the smaller the birth weight, you would probably want to supplement for a longer period of time. Next slide. The key in all this is really to monitor growth closely. We recommend a follow-up visit within 72 hours after NICU discharge to really follow the growth, and then recheck every two weeks until you get a stable weight gain. Any patient that's on post-discharge formula should be followed closely to make sure they're getting adequate weight gain on their regimen, and then also to prevent too rapid weight gain, as I mentioned before. And then ultimately, as is always true in pediatrics, you really should use your clinical judgment and really individualize based on the patient. Next slide. So what about vitamin D? As you know, the AAP recommends vitamin D, 400 units a day, for all infants less than one year of age. Breast milk does not have a lot of vitamin D in it, so breastfeeding infants should, supplement, should be supplemented with 400 units per day. Formulas in the United States have at least 400 units per, um, of vitamin D per liter. And so if they're taking more than a liter of formula, they don't need supplementation. But any partially breastfed infant is probably not taking a liter of formula and should get the full supplementation. Next slide. 
And then what about iron? So we do recommend treating with iron at a maintenance dose of two to three milligrams per kilogram per day for at least the first six months of age. And some recommendations even say 12 months. You could look at the diet of the child when uh, he or she starts to take solids and you may want to adjust accordingly. If the patient's anemic, then you would want to use a therapeutic dose of iron, which would be four to six milligrams per kilogram per day. And then consider monitoring labs. The best thing is to look at the NICU discharge summary and see if there's any recommendations on when the next lab interval should be. So a reminder to NICU providers to put that in the discharge summary. But a general rule of thumb, if you don't see any recommendation, is to consider checking four to six weeks after discharge. Next slide. So why do we treat with iron? We know that these babies have an iron deficit. Some of it is due to prematurity because they lose out on the iron stores they would get from mom in the last trimester of pregnancy. And then often in the NICU, there are a lot of lab draws. So some of it can be iatrogenic. We also know that iron improves developmental outcomes. Next slide. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about immunizations and immunoprophylaxis as it applies to preterm infants. Next slide. So there was a study in pediatrics that showed the completion of a seven vaccine series, and they looked at term and preterm infants. And what they found is with decreasing gestational age, the percent completion also decreased. Next slide. Their conclusions were that preterm infants had lower immunization rates than term infants, and they found that these differences persisted through three years of age. Possible reasons could be parental decisions to delay or not give vaccines, provider decisions to hold off on vaccines, provider knowledge about which, which vaccines are the best to give, and also more frequent illness in these preterm infants and children. Next slide. So let's look at an example. Tina is an next 27 weeker and she's born at 1200 grams. She was discharged from the NICU just last week. She did get her immunizations when she was two months old in the NICU, but she's now three months old. Her weight is 20, 50 grams, and she comes to your office for her first visit and it's December. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So which immunizations or immunoprophylaxis should she be given? And we'll go ahead and launch the poll and we'll let you all put your input in. All right, so let's see what our results are. So 50% of you chose to give all three. 20% um, either would give just the hepi and rotavirus or none of the above, and then a small amount would not give any or would just give the rotavirus. So a good kind of variation. We'll go ahead and close the poll and go to the next slide. So the correct answer is actually to give all three. And we'll talk about all th three of these now. So next slide. We'll start with hepatitis B vaccine. Next slide. So this is the only vaccine for which data clearly indicates a lower response in preterm infants. And this lasts for up to one month of age. Next slide. Hepatitis B vaccine is given in the hospital based on mother's HBSAG status. So if mother is negative 
And if the baby is less than 2000, or excuse me, greater than 2000 grams, then that baby would receive a dose of hepatitis B vaccine within 24 hours of birth, just like a term infant would. For babies that are less than 2000 grams, then it's better to give a dose at one, um, one month chronological age or at hospital discharge, whichever comes first. Next slide. If mother is HBSAG positive, then you wanna give both hepatitis B vaccine and HBIG within 12 hours of birth, regardless of birth weight. Next slide. And if mother's HBSAG status is unknown, then you wanna give the hepatitis B vaccine within 12 hours of birth, also regardless of birth weight. But if the baby's less than 2000 grams, then you would also want to give HBIG in addition to the hep B vaccine within 12 hours of birth. If the baby's greater than two kilograms, you have up to seven days to determine mother's HBSAG status. And if you find she's positive, then you would wanna give HBIG at that time. Next slide. So the bottom line on hepatitis B vaccine is to know that any time the vaccine is given at less than 2000 grams and prior to one month of age, it cannot be counted as part of the primary series. Also remember to give HBIG if the mother's status is unknown and the infant weighs less than 2000 grams. Next slide. Now we'll talk a little bit about rotavirus vaccine. Next slide. So the important thing about rotavirus vaccine is you cannot start this series once the infant turns 15 weeks. Many NICUs don't give this vaccine because it's a live vaccine, although a few will give it on discharge. So it's important to find out if your NICU gives it. Um, if you are a NICU, put that in the discharge summary. And if you're a, a primary care provider to question the NICUs in your area about this. Studies have shown that missed opportunities to start rotavirus right away after NICU discharge um, definitely exist. And it's always important to think of rotavirus vaccine at that first visit after NICU discharge to avoid missed opportunities. Next slide. So a national immunization survey showed that 71% of patients were fully vaccinated for rotavirus. But of the 14% who received no doses, greater than 70% had at least one missed opportunity, 60% had at least two missed opportunities, and over 40% had at least three missed opportunities. So this is definitely something that can be addressed and be prevented. Next slide. Now we'll talk a little bit about palivizumab or synergist prophylaxis. Next slide. Palivizumab can be given to patients less than one year of age if they were born at less than 29 weeks gestational age. Can also be given to infants born less than 32 weeks gestational age who required oxygen for at least 28 days after birth. It can be given to patients who have hemodynamically significant heart disease, and it should be considered for patients with pulmonary abnormalities or neuromuscular disease that can impair their ability to clear secretions. Next slide. For children younger than 24 months of age, they need to have had at least 28 days of supplemental oxygen after birth and continue to require medical intervention within six months of the start of the second RSV season to qualify for palivizumab. It can also be considered for those patients who are profoundly immunocompromised during the RSV season. One thing to remember is that in the outpatient setting, often palivizumab is delayed, and this is due to problems with supply or ordering or insurance coverage. So the important thing for primary care providers to remember is to keep a list of eligible patients to make sure that you can prepare for an adequate supply in advance. Next slide. So general recommendations for immunizations and immunoprophylaxis for preterm infants is to remember that hepatitis B vaccine does have exceptions to the usual immunization schedule. You don't wanna miss that opportunity to give rotavirus vaccine either at NICU discharge or at the first visit after the discharge and keep a list of children who need synergists year round. 
Now I'm going to pass the slides back to Janice, who will talk about screening. Thank you, Jadine. So screening uh, starts in the NICU and then proceeds as the patients are discharged to the outpatient setting. Next slide. This will start off with a case example here. Marco was born at 30 weeks gestational age and weighed 1400 grams at birth. Assuming that he had the appropriate screens in the newborn period, what additional evaluations are recommended by 30 months of age? So please answer the poll now. Uh, answer A is developmental screening. Um, answer B is developmental audiology and ophthalmology. And the third option is audiology and ophthalmology only. So please go ahead and vote. Okay, so it looks like most of you are completely on top of this, which is fantastic. Um, next slide, please. Okay, we can move on to the next slide. Great. So we're going to start off by talking about developmental screening. I think you all know that prematurity is associated with increased risks for many, many things. And among those are developmental delay, as well as vision problems, hearing problems, and family stressors. Next slide. There are so many studies out there that have looked at outcome measures um, for premature um, children, infants and children. And I'm gonna just focus my attention today on a couple of meta-analyses um, from 2018 that looked at a lot of, a lot of um, studies that had many children in them. Next slide. The first, the me first meta-analysis included over 10,000 very preterm and very low birth weight infants. And it showed um, pretty convincingly that there's disc, um, increased risk of cognitive delays, motor delays, and cerebral palsies um, in all of these children. Next slide. And another meta-analysis looked at over 6,000 preterm infants and compared them with over 5,000 term infants. And this study showed higher level um, measurements that were associated with prematurity, things such as intelligence measures, executive functioning, and processing speed. Next slide. We also know that late preterm infants are also affected. Um, and they're affected by things that can affect them the entirety of their life. There are developmental disabilities, increased school failures, increased behavioral problems, um, other kinds of, of disabilities, and even death is increased in late preterm infants. Next slide. The AAP recommends developmental screening using an evidence-based tool at nine months, 18 months, and 30 months. In addition, they recommend general screening at every well-child visit and that the um, primary care provider should schedule other visits as indicated. So these requirements and recommendations recommendations are consistent with the recommendations that um, are made for all children um, and including preterm infants and children. It's important to follow the milestones carefully and particularly in preterm um, infants and children, it's important to check for abnormalities of tone and movement at each visit. Next slide. So when examining a child, think about their milestones, hypertonia, hypotonia, reflexes, as well as abnormal movements and postures. Next slide. You can see in this slide, um, this child has normal looking postures and um, also movement patterns that appear normal as this child progresses through his development. Next slide. 
However, we also see children like this, uh, both in the NICU and also in the outpatient setting who have hypotonia. Next slide. We also see children that have increased tone. Um, they might present with scissoring and spasticity. Um, it's very important for all of these children, whether it's decreased tone or increased tone or abnormal movement patterns, that they re re receive referrals um, as quickly as possible. Next slide. Some of the most common referrals for developmental concerns are to early intervention programs, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech and language therapy, and also to other pediatric subspecialists such as orthopedics, neurology, and genetics. Next slide. We will talk next about hearing screening. What we know is that infants that spend time in the NICU have a greater, have an in, greater risk of hearing loss in the general population. It's approximately 10 times the rate um, than the general population. They are primarily, primarily due to sensory neural hearing loss as well as audio, auditory neuropathy. Next slide. Some of the risk factors for hearing loss are low birth weight, hyperbilirubinemia, hypoxia, and also exposure to ototoxic drugs, um, as well as infection. Next slide. We know that early intervention makes a difference. So that's where primary care comes into play. It's really important that children um, have, have uh, hearing loss identified quickly and that intervention takes place as quickly as possible. This was a prospective study um, right at the time that universal hearing screening in the newborn nursery uh, started. Um, and this showed that hearing loss that was detected prior to nine months of age increased long-term skills, and including long-term reading and comprehension skills through the teen years. In addition, it was shown that amplification with hearing aids by six months of age was also associated with better early language skills. Next slide. The American Academy of Pediatrics has a program called Early Hearing Detection and Intervention 136. And the 136 means hearing screening by one month of age, the diagnosis of hearing loss by three months of age, and enrollment in intervention by six months of age. Next slide. What we know is that children who have met the one, three, and six requirements have improved outcomes. They have increased vocabulary, and it also helped all children. It was regardless of their hearing loss or other determining factors such as socioeconomic factors. So this early intervention helped all children in the study. Next slide. The AAP guidelines for early hearing detection and intervention are that all newborns be screened um, either using ABR or OAE, that NICU admissions for more than five days be screened with ABR, and that readmissions for certain high-risk conditions such as hyperbilirubinemia with exchange transfusion or culture-positive sepsis also should be rescreened um, at that admission. Next slide. The AAP guidelines also um, include recommendations for referral to audiology before three months of age for all, new, uh, for all NICU admissions greater than five days, and then close monitoring of language skills, auditory skills, middle ear status, and if there's any concerns to, have, uh, to refer sooner than 30 months for any kinds of concerns about hearing or language milestones. Next slide. Next, we're gonna talk about ophthalmologic screening. Next. I think it comes as no surprise that uh, premature infants are at higher risk for retinopathy of prematurity. This is mostly um, in the group of children that are less than 1500 grams at birth and less than 30 weeks uh, gestational age at birth. There are a few infants that do not meet these criteria a little bit above the, um, the, these uh, cutoffs that might have had an unstable clinical course that are also screened for retinopathy of prematurity. Next slide. 
The timing of the screening is at 31 weeks of postmenstrual age for infants born 22 to 26 weeks gestational age. And it's at four weeks of chronologic age for infants born greater than 27 weeks. The follow-up visits are prescribed um, and the ophthalmologists have um, follow a certain criteria. So it is based on the findings at the exam as to when the interval for follow-up is indicated. Next slide. This is just a chart that shows the um, ages at which children should be screened. So what we know is that children that are uh, more preterm are at higher risk. So overall, the severe retinopathy of prematurity occurs in about 10% of children less than 32 weeks. But you can see on this slide that 34% of children less than 24 weeks are affected. And generally children who are greater than 32 weeks are not at risk and most that are over 28 weeks have mild disease that doesn't require treatment. So it's really the very young, young children that have the highest risk for retinopathy. Next slide. In addition to the initial screenings for retinopathy, it is also recommended that um, children have an additional ophthalmologic exam at four to six months after NICU discharge or op discharge from ophthalmologic care, whichever is the later of those two. Next. In addition, preterm children are at higher risk for other kinds of eye problems, um, including um, refractive errors, strabismus, loss of peripheral vision. Um, so it's important that children continue to receive eye care um, through their childhood. Next slide. Next, we're going to move on to psychosocial screening. We know that, that um, mothers are always at risk for postpartum depression after birth of their children. Um, but the parents of preterm infants are at higher risk because of the stressors that are involved in the care of these children, as well as the sometimes traumatic and very scary experiences that they have at the time of birth or in the NICU. Next slide. Some studies have shown um, that there is increased PTSD symptoms in mothers of preterm infants compared to the mothers of term infants. Some studies have also shown that while these diminish over time, they still remain higher in the mothers of preterm infants. And also, it's most, more likely that referrals are made when the symptoms become severe. So I think it's very important to um, both in the NICU and after discharge for everyone to be cognizant of the stress that families are under and to make referrals and help um, provide resources for families before severe symptoms may emerge. Next slide. Um, so just a summary of the screening, we want to pay attention to neurodevelopmental screening, hearing screening, vision screening, and psychosocial screening. Next slide. Um, and this actually is the part of today's lecture that I think Jadine and I are most excited about, and that is uh, working on care coordination and transition from the NICU to the primary care setting. Next slide. We have provided some guidelines, and the first one is to provide and arrange all possible care before discharge. So I think if COVID hasn't taught us anything, it's certainly taught us that we don't really know what tomorrow will bring. I think we all remember how quickly um, outpatient settings shut down and some inpatient settings also shut down quickly um, when you know emergencies were declared in different counties and, and parts of the state. Um, so I think we never know what's going to be happening. We also in recent months have had families that have had to evacuate for fires. So while you might be planning on a child being seen 48 to 72 hours after NICU discharge, I think we can't 
always know that that's going to happen. So anything that can be done prior to discharge um, is ideal. So if you can update immunizations and if you have the capacity to give palivizumab prior to discharge, that is always preferred. In addition, besides connecting these children with their primary care setting, it's really helpful if um, referrals can be made to early intervention um, as and ophthalmology, audiology, other subspecialties, as well as therapeutic interventions. I don't know if any everyone knows this, but um, once a referral is made to early intervention, early intervention has 45 days in which to um, evaluate the child and provide a care plan for the family. So if this, these kinds of referrals can be made prior to discharge, it starts the clock, stick, clock ticking and, uh, will, and this child will be more likely to receive services more quickly. Next slide. So our second um, discharge guidelines is to include primary care guidance and relevant information in the discharge summary. Next slide. So what we have developed is a um, Word document that is designed to be included um, and adapted to your electronic medical record. So this is a Word document that can be downloaded off of our website and it includes the recommendations that we have reviewed today. It also allows you to be able to change anything on this that you would like to. So for example, if your institution um, has nutrition recommendations that might, be very, might vary somewhat from those that we have posted, um, you can certainly change that to meet what your institution likes to follow. In addition, you can add contact information for your facility. You can also add contact information for local early intervention programs, as well as local subspecialists if children need ophthalmo um, ophthalm ophthalmology or audiology. So we're hoping that this will be a, um, a useful tool for those of you who work in the NICUs and also useful for the primary care physician who is on the receiving end um, of these children and the discharge summaries. I can uh, tell you as a, form, as a primary care physician, any kind of guidance um, is certainly appreciated. And again, because it's really hard to keep up on the uh, most recent recommendations. Primary care physicians, depending on how many preterm infants they see, while they see a lot of of, of preterm infants, they might not see the much, the much younger ones. So they might not see a 32 weeker or a 28 weeker, except for maybe once a year or a couple times, once every two or three years. So the greater um, amount of information that the NICUs can provide um, will be helpful to primary care providers. Next slide. Um, we also um, would like for the NICUs to be able to help provide reference material for primary care providers. Um, next slide. And so we have um, developed a toolkit, which is available on the CPQCC website. And um, this is one of many quality improvement tools. And uh, those of you who work in the NICUs are probably familiar with some of these other tools. Next slide. And we have also um, developed some uh, tip sheets and here you can see on the right side is are the links to the tip sheets that um, the primary care tip sheet and the primary care periodicity chart and as well as the modifiable word document um, which is um, available off of this website next slide so just to review the tip sheets um, next slide so this is um, a summary of the recommendations and things that we have discussed today. And again, I think that this is really helpful for primary care providers. If uh, NICUs can provide um, links to this on their discharge summaries or for primary care uh, providers, that would be very helpful to most of them. And then next slide. And this is a periodicity chart. Um, it contains the same information as the prior um, sheet, but this one is more geared for um, 
knowing what age the child is and what kinds of information. So I would find this one most useful in, in primary care, for example, if you are seeing a nine month old that you haven't seen before, who is recently transferred to your care, you can go down the nine month column on this sheet and you can um, see what kinds of interventions, what kinds of appointments the child would be due for at, uh, this, at that specific age. Okay, next slide. So Jadine and I would both like to thank all of those who have contributed to our development of this toolkit and the tip sheets. And particularly, we'd like to recognize Anjali for managing today's webinar. Um, we have received a lot of support throughout our institution and neighboring institutions for our project today. And next slide. And then we would like to also acknowledge all of you who are providing such amazing care for all of these preterm infants and children, both in the NICU, both in primary care, subspecialists, as well as all of those of you who are in the community providing care for, for these children. And with that, I think we'll move on to questions and answers. All right, thanks, Janice. So we do have some questions coming in and uh, some of them are relevant to what I talked about. So I'll start talking, but feel free to jump in if you have any comments or thoughts too. So the first question is that uh, a primary care provider was told uh, by their hospitalist that powder formula is not recommended for infants less than two months of age, especially preemies because it's not sterile. Um, and so is that a concern when fortifying mom's breast milk with powder? Um, I know that in our hospital, we actually don't use any powders for that reason. We have only liquid formulas and fortifiers uh, when we're taking care of the premature babies. In my particular group, when we discharge those babies, once they go home, we tell the parents that it's okay for them to use powdered formula. Um, and I think our feeling is by the time that we send them home, then um, they are, their immune system is, is stronger and they should be able to handle that. Um, but you should check with your specific hospital and see what the policies are and what the recommendations are. Because again, it could be different for a different geographical region or for a different group or institution. Another question is what follow-up should be provided in the 72 hours post-discharge? Um, if we're doing a post-discharge call to the parents, what should we be asking them specifically with regards to feeding and growth? I think this is a good question because I know that many primary care providers are doing telehealth visits. Um, and so I'm wondering if this is a question is if this would be a post-discharge call or telehealth visit versus an in-person visit. Um, my personal feeling is that probably the newborn visit would be better to, to do in-person so that you could actually get a, a baseline weight from your clinic of the patient. Um, and I see that visit as being just comprehensive to go over everything that happened in the NICU, go over any follow-ups. As Janice said, make sure that those are coordinated. Um, go over the feeding plan, as well as what the growth <clears throat> trajectory has been, and then also showing them those growth charts. Um, so I think an in-person visit and getting the weight and then discussing kind of the plan up to that point and, and what would be going on from there would be good to meet with the parents. Um, Janice, do you have any specific thoughts in terms of, you know, especially with screening and other follow-up that you would want to definitely cover in that first visit? Um, I'm sorry, I was answering a question, so I actually didn't hear what you were talking about. No worries. So this, this primary care provider wants to know about that first visit, uh, their first post-discharge visit, that if it is, um, you know, and again, it might be telehealth, it might be in person. I recommend it in person to actually get the weight mm -hmm. um, and, you know, to especially go over those follow up things that you mentioned. But um, anything in particular you want to definitely highlight at that first visit. Um, I agree that the um, follow up for weight and feeding is the most important at that moment. And also knowing how the family is doing psychosocially because again it's a big step for them to take the children home and a lot of times I find that parents are really stressed out about um, something that might happen, like the child might stop breathing. You know, they've had a lot of alarms go off in the NICU. So I think that the feeding and the growth and the stress level of the family are the things that I like to focus on in that first visit. All right, great. 
Another question is, what are the recommended lactation support guidelines to ensure that breast milk feeding is encouraged in the hospital and post-discharge? Um, I know for in our institution, any baby that's admitted to the NICU or the intermediate uh, step-down nursery always gets a one-on-one -on -one lactation consult with the lactation specialist, and they work directly with these mothers to come up with a plan. I know a lot of primary care providers also have access to lactation uh, lactation specialists, and I think that, that I would encourage that they continue to meet with those lactation specialists to make sure that breast milk is encouraged. Um, we always encourage the mothers as soon as the babies are born to pump their milk, even if the baby's too sick or an, unable to breastfeed directly. Um, and so we are always focusing on, on breast milk as being the most important. We also have an option to give donor breast milk if we need to feed the baby and mother's milk is not in yet. That's an option for the parents as well. Um, I see another question on vitamin D, oh, comment on vitamin D, what about multivitamin recommendations? Um, so many of the babies I know at our institution, we do discharge them on polyvisol, um, and that is to just further enhance their, their vitamin and mineral complement. Um, but there's no, again, there's no gold standard recommendation to discharge on polyvisol, and so Janice and I um, decided to, in looking at the recommendations, to only focus on vitamin D because, again, it will differ with region and institution uh, which vitamins they're actually discharged on. Um, let's see, until what age should they, should they be corrected on the growth chart? Um, so our EMR shows the correction up to three years of age. And Janice, I know you've looked into this a little bit more. Is three years of age usually what you recommend for correcting on the growth chart as well? Um, well, I think it varies. The recommendations vary. I think it's pretty universal to do it absolutely till two years of age. And then some other recommendations are till three. Um, the, with, with increasing time, that interval becomes less and less in, important. So I personally, this is a personal recommendation. I think it's never wrong to correct. Um, but by, by um, kind of convention, most people uh, correct only until two to three years of age. This is a question for you. The AAP guidelines 136, is that only recommended for those who failed the hearing screen or will be standard on preterm babies? Um, so thanks for that question. Um, if they pass the, the newborn hearing screen, so the one, then they do not need to go on and have the three and six. So it's those who fail the, um, the newborn hearing screen, um, number one, they, then they need to go on and have a full diagnostic by three months of age and intervention if needed by six months of age. And then someone else said that uh, they noticed that the AP recommendations for developmental screening differs from the CPQCC high-risk infant follow-up recommendations. Um, this is from a high-risk infant follow-up coordinator. So which should they follow? Um, the, so I'm not sure if you're talking about other CPQCC HRIF recommendations, but the, um, the ones that I reviewed today are the AAP recommendations for developmental screening. So I'm thinking I, if this is a high-risk infant follow-up coordinator, then maybe they should go with the CPQCC specific high-risk infant follow-up recommendations because that would be uh, specific to California. Right, right. But again, it's important to just focus, talk to your institution and see what their recommendation is as well because um, AAP is nationwide, so it may be different for each uh, location. Uh, it says, can you please clarify the audiology screening recommendations for any preterm infant born less than 37 weeks who've passed the ALGA before NICU discharge? Do they need to get a formal audiology, audiology referral exam again before 30 months or only if concerns arise? If yes, what is the preferred age to refer? Okay. So, um, the answer to this question is yes, it is recommended that all children um, who were preterm and well, actually, all children who spent more than five days in the NICU um, be rescreened. And they chose that five days as trying to capture the bulk of children that are at the highest risk. Um, and it is recommended because the initial is a screen, not a, a full audiology test. So it should be done sometime before 30 months and sooner than that if concerns arose. 
So we have a few more questions, but I do recognize it's one o'clock. Um, if people want to stay on, Janice, maybe we could answer the questions. I don't know what your timing is like. Um, I can stay on. I would like to just say that for the people who need to leave, for more information, the slides and the webinar recording will be on the CPQCC website uh, probably by later today. And if you have any other questions or concerns about the content uh, or anything else that you see on the website, please feel free to email me at jadine.wong at stanford.edu. And Janice and I can coordinate and make sure we get the uh, information to your questions. Um, all right, so there's a question here. Instead of powdered formula, parents can obtain liquid human milk fortifier through a program supported by Abbott Labs that ships out a box of HMF packets to be used with mother's milk. So that would be good as a resource. I don't know in terms of insurance coverage how that would work. So you'd have to work with your individual institution. Um, regarding recommendations for lab monitoring, um, we did a in our literature search. We found that there are no typical recommendations. They, the recommendations actually vary, um, and there's no one consensus. So that's why we say it's good to coordinate with the NICU to see what the NICU recommends in terms of what they were following on the baby and what would be important uh, after discharge. Um, how do you think we reinforce breastfeeding to mothers? Um, when they come back to the hospital for hyperbilirubinemia, um, no overfeeding, but the primary care providers order formula as a supplement and how to avoid that. And I think that may be an institution question where you would want to talk with your hospital. And we actually have an order set for hyperbilirubinemia patients that uh, really is uh, by consensus how we would want to manage those babies. So that would be a good suggestion that you may want to work together with your institution. Regarding using transitional formulas in late preterm infants, they are usually greater than 1800 grams at birth. And, and I think so this is an example where you would want to individualize and look at the growth trajectory. If they're growing well with mom's milk and she has a good production, then post-discharge formula may not be necessary. But if you do find that they're not growing adequately, then you could do a little bit of supplementation and then just follow the growth curve. Giannis, it says, it was mentioned to start doing the referral early as it takes 45 days to have or to complete a family care plan. When is it best to send the referral? Would it be one week before discharge? Um, I think, I don't think that's a problem to send it before discharge. I think that in general, most people wait until the child is pretty ready to go home before, um, because they, they're going to be contacted the family to set up an appointments for evaluation. So that's kind of impractical if the child is not yet at home. So, so wait to very close to the discharge, if not time at the time of discharge. Right. Okay. I think that because we're a few minutes over, I, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So if you have other questions, please feel free to send that to me by email. And we really appreciate your listening to our presentation. And please feel free when you have time to look at the toolkit and the other resources and uh, let us know if you have any other questions. Thank you again so much for joining.